What is up, NFL fans? Welcome back to another episode of the NFL Whip Around. I'm Jeff Hartman, joined by Coach KT Smith. Before we get into the five topics that we always talk about here in the NFL Whip Around, we want to make sure that if you're watching on YouTube, give us a like the video, subscribe to the channel. We appreciate it if you're listening in audio form on audio, Apple Podcasts or Spotify, give us a five star rating. Leave us a good comment on Apple Podcasts. It does help. We do appreciate it. Our audience is growing, and we thank everyone for listening. With all that out of the way, Coach, what's up? How's it going? Going great. Just uh, getting excited for tweets about guys in shorts pushing around bags at OTAs. I've, I've, I will always say this. Football in shorts is better than no football at all. So people that want to complain, and I'll be the first to say that the videos that go all around social media of like Joe Burrow throwing side, you know, a pass in shorts, like, oh, that's – that's nothing like he's starting in shorts. Like it's not that big of a deal, but yeah, we've talked about that before. You said there's still some value in that part of the process, correct? Yes, absolutely. And I do, I do believe that there is. And, uh, but I think it's the things that you and I don't see. That's the most valuable stuff. The things we do see, which are the the tweets and the little videos, anything the NFL is willing to let us see right now is not that valuable. It's pretty generic stuff. So and, until they, until they do a hard knocks OTAs. <laughs> That's the subject they're, they're we're going to get to. Yeah, but <laughs> I don't think we're going to get a whole lot of, uh, you know, in-depth information. Well, let me ask you this before we go to our first topic. So like the Steelers, you know, we're talking about Cam Hayward, who said that I'm not going to go to OTAs. And he's not the only veteran that's like, they're organized team activities. They're optional, mandatory. Mini camp is different. For a veteran outside of the leadership aspect, is it a big deal if they miss these? No, I don't think so at all. I think this is, it's team building. That's, that's a, there's a part of that that you would like everybody there for. But with a guy like Cam Hayward, nobody questions his commitment to the organization and his presence when he gets there will speak for itself. So I think that that process is a lot more important for the younger guys and the guys that you've just signed who are new to the organization. And so most of the guys who do hold out tend to be the Cam Hayward types and not the guys for whom this process is valuable. All right. Good point. All right. Let's get things started off with our first topic, which is all about the NFL schedule. Last week when we did this show, the schedule was not fully released. We had some key games mixed in here and there. But with the league schedule out, which week one storyline do you like the best? So you have like the Steelers offensive coordinator, former Falcons head coach, Arthur Smith goes back to Atlanta. That's intriguing. Uh, the Rams, Going back to Detroit, that's where they lost in the playoffs last year in the wild card round. Or is it Aaron Rodgers going to his hometown in the Bay Area uh, versus the as the Jets go and play the 49ers? Which storyline are you taking here? Well, I'll take the the rematch between the Rams and Detroit. I think that was a great game. Uh, Jared Goff just got paid, and he's going to have an opportunity now as a $50-plus million-a-year quarterback to suit up against the team that gave up on him. I think that's an interesting storyline. The Rams pretty much dumped Jared Goff because they, A, I think thought they had a better fit in Matthew Stafford, but B, I don't think that they felt like Jared Goff was the guy that could get them back to the Super Bowl. I think that they felt the way he had played against New England kind of exposed his limitations, and they believed they could do better, and so they unloaded him. And then he goes to Detroit and and revives his career. And now he's had two really good seasons. And then Matthew Stafford now coming back to Detroit. So there's some good stuff there. I know we just did it in January, but I think the NFL liked it uh, so much that they're willing to do it again. For storylines, I agree 100% that that is the most intriguing storyline. When it comes to the game, I think that the best game should be Jets at 49ers. Would you agree with that? That should be a great game for sure. I think the anticipation of Aaron Rodgers now finally playing uh, real minutes for the Jets in his old hometown. He grew up in the Bay Area, rooting for the 49ers, et cetera. Uh, And I think that, you know, I'm not going to say they're evenly matched. I think obviously the 49ers are a better team, but the Jets are good on paper. So that will be a good game for sure. Yeah, I think the least intriguing one is Arthur Smith going back to Atlanta. I understand the storyline and the week one storyline is there and it exists and it might be some internal motivation for the Steelers to want to, you know, go down and let's, hey, especially if they cling to Arthur Smith and and what he's preaching and how he's coaching up the offense, they might say, let's go down there and win one 
for for art for Arthur Smith. I don't know. You don't but, think that uh, moves the national needle too <laughs> too far? I think the one that so, may for the Steelers, the one that may move the national needle a little bit is the next week when Russell yes, Wilson goes too. to Denver. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I was kind of surprised that that wasn't a primetime game or at least a 425 slot. I don't think it is a 425, is it? I thought it was a 1 o'clock start off the check. But, uh, yeah, Russell Wilson going back with the Sean Payton and how that ended and how horrible it was. and The Broncos, who's going to be their quarterback in week two with Stidham or is it going to be Bo Nix early out of the gate? Uh, that's going to be I, – you know Russell Wilson had that circled. The moment that – came out he's like i want to crush these guys so that, yeah week two i think the steelers have that one all right let's go to the next topic we are both steeler fans people should know that by now if they listen to our show every week and as a, a lot has been made about the brutal closing stretch of the steeler schedule which includes six afc north games it's all of their divisional games for those that are not good at mathematics uh they also have games against philadelphia and kansas city and then after the buying week 10, they play the commanders. That's their whole finish after their week nine bye week for back for lack of a better term. Did the league screw the Steelers with the schedule? What do you think about that finishing stretch for the Steelers? It's a brutal stretch, no doubt, but I don't think that there was anybody in the league office that was like, you know, let's stick it to Pittsburgh. And, and if you're the Steelers, you have to make the most of this schedule because they were going to play all these teams yeah. On their schedule in some fashion. They're going to play them scattered throughout the year or kind of the way it works out, all in this big clump at the end. So you have to take advantage. If you're Pittsburgh, you really have to take advantage of those first nine games when you know, we're not going to rattle off all of the games right now, but they're all winnable for Pittsburgh. Every single game in, in, the, in those, they get eight weeks, then the bye, commanders out of the break before they hit that brutal close. Every one of those games is winnable. And if you're Mike Tomlin, you really have to have a great summer and, and position yourself. So that when you come into that stretch, you're still in good shape. You're six and three, seven and two, something like that. Because otherwise, it's going to be rough for sure. So someone from the league office actually was interviewed by some pool reporters for the Steelers media, you know, their their beat writers, so to speak. And they were basically asking this person from the NFL who helps with the schedule, like, were you all aware of this? All six divisional games in the back half. The NFL representative said we were aware we didn't see it as something that's a negative. Now, I'm sorry. like I don't buy that. For me, if I'm putting all the games into the algorithm and all of a sudden it spits out 32 schedules and we're going through and we're looking at each one, and let's say you're Roger Goodell, and I see that the Steelers have all six of their divisional games in, in a matter of eight games in the back half, I'm going to say, hey, Rog, we might have a problem here. Like, do we want to space these out a little bit? Even if we just take two and move them to the front half, I, I don't see how like the NFL admits that they were aware of it before the schedule was officially released and yet did nothing about it. And they are not alone. Chicago bears also don't have a divisional game until I think the same week as the Steelers. I don't get how that happens. How do you create a schedule that way? Coach, try to make it make sense. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. That doesn't make sense. I, I would be more willing to bet that it was a, either an oversight or it was something that the NFL probably with all the other things going on, didn't really think about as clearly as they could have, especially when you consider they're going to play four of those games in a row. And then coming out of that four week stretch, they're going to play the Eagles on a short week on four days rest. And that is, that's insane. Yeah. Uh, and that, and that's, you, know, you think, I think I just think about, all right, where, where I coach, we have a, we have a big rival right across the bridge from Ocean City. It's, it's actually my alma mater. Huge, huge rivalry in all sports, but particularly in football. And even even when one of us is not very good, that game's a slugfest. And you come out of that game kind of beat up, you know. And then the next week in practice, you have to mediate that a little bit. You got to take care of your bodies and you got to make sure that the kids are ready to go the following week. I can't imagine playing that rivalry game four weeks in a row because that's the equivalent in the AFC North. This is a bruising division, the toughest division in football, where all the teams seem to have a, a reasonable degree of dislike for one another and, and where those contests are notoriously physical. So yes, I think the league, come on, the league, you the league had to be aware of, of the toll that this is going to take on yeah. a team. 
Are you, let, let's go off the script a little bit. Are you aware of the rumors? Cons, you know, I love conspiracy theories in sports. Like I love putting the tinfoil hat on my head. Are you, do you believe the whole, the NFL looked at Taylor Swift's tour dates and they tried to accommodate the Kansas city chiefs due to those tour dates? Uh, if that's true, then we've now entered a new phase of soft in America. <laughs> Dude, it's true, Coach. It ha- I guarantee you it's true. How many fans do you think she brought in? We talked about this last season. Yeah, what hundreds of people, thousands. You had people that never watched a game. They were texting you like, oh, the, the, look at this Chiefs, you know, whatever. They're bringing in all these new fans. They want to accommodate those fans. They want to make sure Taylor is visible. They want to make sure she's there. The worst thing that could happen is if they break up and they're no, she's no longer the cash cow that she is for the National Football League. You don't think so. You don't think they did that. I mean, if, if they did, why involve the Steelers? Oh, no, it's not about the Steelers. It's just about the Chiefs. Okay. So, but, um, if, if, but if they're going to look at the Eras tour, Taylor Swift's tour, and they're going to look at those dates so closely to make sure that she's able to make as many Chiefs games as possible, and yet you're going to ignore, they're going to admit that they knew about the Steelers situation, and they're going to ignore it. That tells me all I need to know about the National Football League, which is, a, it's been a clown show for a long time anyways. Well, we always say this. We've said this many times. The the NFL, the one thing that they really get right is marketing. Yeah. The one thing that they really get wrong is optics in terms of fairness or hu- or humility, humanity, concern for the, you know, the the people who create the product on which so many others are profiting. They've never been great, whether it's concussions, whether it's spousal abuse. In this instance, whether it's just like, hey, maybe we shouldn't put some these players through this grind because it's just not physically feasible. They've yeah. never been good at that. You could have saved yourself a lot of time there and said the NFL is really good at marketing and they're not good at and then just finish it with everything else. <laughs> <laughs> because that's be. it. That it's yeah. it's turning into a marketing firm. And oh yeah, we also play games on almost every single day of the week now. But let's let's go to our next topic. Speaking of scheduling disadvantages, here are some less obvious but potentially difficult scheduling quirks some teams will face. Which one do you think can create the biggest disadvantage? Here we go. A, with the Chiefs getting a Friday game and a Wednesday game due to Black Friday and Christmas, they'll be the first team in 97 years to play on six different days of the week. Let's go to B. Detroit will play 13 of their first 14 games indoors. Their only outdoor game in that span will be at Lambeau Field in Week 9. C, the 49ers will face four teams coming off their bye week and altogether have a minus 22-day rest differential compared to their opponents. This means their opponents get 22 days of extra rest compared to the 49ers. So, A, the Chiefs getting a Friday game and a Wednesday game and playing six different days of the week. B, Detroit playing inside except for a week nine trip to Lambeau. Or C, the 49ers minus 22-day rest. What do you think? Whew, they're all they're all challenging in their own way. I'll let you talk about the last one if you if you want because I think that's obviously a huge issue from a coaching standpoint. Playing on six different days of the week is a pain in the butt because you have to completely rework everything that goes with the production of uh, of a football game, and that includes travel plans, hotel rooms. Now, granted. These are not being done by the head coach. It's not like uh, you, know, you know Andy Reid's going to be on the phone making reservations at, at the Marriott. But yeah. but it's all annoying stuff that has to be taken care of, and a lot of little boxes that have to be checked. Routines are big, especially for for guys who have been in the league for a long time, like Andy Reid. You want to be able to say, on Monday we do this, on Tuesday we do this, on Wednesday we do this, and to have to alter that constantly and vary when you're going to do your installs, when you're going to do your film sessions, even little things like uh, we got to, we got to change our walkthroughs today or uh, to know that your players are going to want to, to uh, n- try to normalize their schedules with their families and things like that. That's a pain in the butt. So I don't think, I don't think it's, it's the biggest disadvantage of the three that we just talked about, but I, I think it's, it's going to require a lot of organization from the coaching standpoint. When I think about topics like this, the one thing I ask myself, especially from a scheduling perspective, is is this is would this be a situation or an issue with a team no matter what? So Detroit, 
they have a lot of teams with domes on their schedule. So it's just weird that 13 out of 14 are in domes. But I mean, when you have a schedule that has a lot of dome teams, what are you going to do? Like you have to play in a dome and they, their home field is a dome. So automatically, uh, I think the NFC has nine games at home this year. So nine of those are obviously going to be indoors. They go to Minnesota twice or they go to Minnesota once that's dome. So I, I don't really lean on that one so much because it was going to happen anyways. But again, just like with the Steelers and the AFC North, all those six games, and then the Eagles and, and Chiefs being packed together, the 49ers, I think, have a real gripe. They have mm-hmm. a real gripe to the fact that, okay, you want us to be in prime time, and that's great. But, man, don't don't screw us over because you want us to be on TV more and in front of a national audience. And I feel like that's kind of what's happening there. You brought up a great point. The Steelers actually play five out of seven days of the week this year. And the Chiefs, I'm sorry, yeah. They'll be the first team to play on six days. The Steelers play on five, and I think there's another team as well. But the 49ers, I think they do have a gripe. I think they have a gripe to say, like, okay, I we get it. You know, been in the NFC Championship, been to a Super Bowl, but still, my gosh, like you're giving a clear advantage to the opponent. And I don't like that at all. Yeah. And you know, the, the Detroit thing, I just looked it up. They play all those indoor games and the the two outdoor games, week nine at Lambeau. So after eight right. straight games in perfect climate controlled conditions you go to Lambo which in early November could be nasty yeah, and then in week 15 your next outdoor game you're you're in Chicago where the wind it's going to be December the wind's going to be howling and that's something you're going to have to plan for now I'm sure they have an outdoor practice facility and you're going to have to spend a lot of time uh, in your outdoor practice facility but the the difference in you know, between being indoors and then being on the lake in December is, is significant as well. So again, I don't think the NFL is going to redo the schedules no. to, just to eliminate these quirks. Uh, and they probably weren't important to the NFL when they made those schedules, but yes, I, th- I think all three of these teams have some challenges for sure. Let me ask you this quick aside about the domes. You know, you hear like Cleveland is looking for a new stadium. And a lot of people are saying like the Cleveland, they, they, they want a dome. They, they, they want to have, and it's because they want to host the Super Bowl. And I get it. They, if you, you can't have Cleveland, the mistake by the lake, you can't have them host a Super Bowl in January or early February. It's going to be miserable. Do you feel like they're trying to take the elements out of the game, though? Because there yeah. used to be something about going to Chicago at the end of the year, going to Pittsburgh, playing in the snow in New England, something along those lines, Lambeau Field with the, the grass that's covered in snow. Now they have those it's that thermal, like it's like a rug almost underneath the turf. that's supposed to melt snow and it's not going to lay as much. What are we doing? Like, I get that it's a billion dollar industry and I get that you want the best play possible, but do you feel that they're trying to eliminate the elements a little bit? Yes, absolutely. Especially given how important quarterbacks are to the league. They want scoring. uh, They want good quarterback play. They want to showcase their marquee players. The shame of it is there's nothing better than watching a snow game. Yes. There's not, I root for it every year. Every year when the playoffs schedule comes out, I immediately look to see which cold weather teams are hosting games because I want there to be snow. The most excited I ever was for a football game, I played a game in college in the snow up at Union College in Schenectady, New York, and it was freaking <laughs> cold, man. And it was snowing, and our team was as hype as I've ever seen our team. I mean, it was it was so exciting, so much fun, such a great atmosphere. And it's a shame, again, that the NFL – sort of misses that yeah it, it does suck it does suck all right let's go to our fourth topic in non-schedule news the league announced they have chosen the giants to be featured on the training camp version of hard knocks what are your thoughts on hard knocks in general and the choice of the giants in particular hard knock hard knocks is expanding now i mean they they already have an in-season hard knocks. I think last year might have been the Dolphins. The year before might have been the Cardinals. They always had. They've always had the training camp. There's also talk about an off-season hard knocks as they teams gear up for the draft and the combine and all that stuff. Let's talk first. What about your take? What's your take on hard knocks? Do you like it? Love it. Love hard knocks. Uh, I love it so long as uh, HBO continues to predominantly make it about football that now they get into sort of the side stories and, and they get some good ones. You get, you get like the long shot rookie and then they'll do one on the, you know, the veteran and his family. I mean, they, they kind of have a, a bit of a formula down for how they want to do the show, but 
once they start to turn it, and I, I almost feel like this is inevitable, but they turn to become more like a Bravo show. Where it's where it's you know, the, you know the real the real athletes of the NFL, then <laughs> then I'll give up on it. But for right now, it's still very much about football. I love the scenes where you where you see the coaching, you see the 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 discussions uh, in office. I'll never forget the year where it where it was the Bengals and Todd Haley, who had been fired from Pittsburgh, had gone and he was a, an assistant there. No, I'm sorry, it was Cleveland. Cleveland, yeah, right. And Hugh Jackson was the head coach, and Todd Haley. Just blistered Hugh Jackson. We have we have no culture. We have no structure. We have no organization. So coming from a place like Pittsburgh, where you have all those things, to Cleveland, he just blistered Hugh Jackson in the meeting room, and it was so visibly uncomfortable. You could see like the guys around that table squirming and almost like getting small in their chairs, and Hugh Jackson trying to sort of you know smooth everything over but that's like the real stuff that happens you have conflicts among your staffs you have moments where guys are getting after each other it's really cool to see now i don't know if this is still factual or not but it used to be and back when cleveland had hard knocks it was that the team gets to see every episode before it airs and they can always say you're not showing that so take that off get cut that out so the fact that the browns watched it and said yeah, let's show Todd Haley try to undermine the head coach in front of the entire staff. Yeah, go ahead and roll it. Roll the tape, guys. Like, they oh. actually did that. Like, that's insane. And I'm sure that that's still a thing where they have final say over what goes out there. Because really, I mean, when you think about it, a football team might say, you can't show that. Like, that, that's part of our game plan. Or the, the terminology that you have us using, like, we use that in game. And that's right. maybe it's a, a quarterback that that is, uh, you know, audibling out of something or checking out of a, a different thing. I don't know, but I've never been a, I've never watched a lot of hard knocks mainly because I never have HBO, but the clips that I do see are fascinating. And I hate, I, I, I rue the day that the Steelers are on there because I'm going to have to get HBO for like two months. And hmm. because I'm going to watch, I, I love it for the entertainment, but would you want the Steelers to be on hard knocks as a fan? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I can't you wait till they're on hard knocks. You would because a lot of people say it's a distraction and they don't like it. Ah, psh, you know, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I know I really I really think that that would be awesome to see behind the you know let's peek behind the curtain, man. You know, yeah. let's see let's see what's going on uh, in in terms of all that. And I would love to see a Mike Tomlin's personality come through and just those interactions. I mean, you, you want to get a little bit of a of a of a more of a personal look at your favorite team. Mike Tomlin would either walk off like in middle of interviews, like he did at the end of the season last year when he was asked about his contract, or he would be a great, uh, a great person to listen to. Like when he was on the pivot podcast with Ryan Clark was phenomenal. I mean, just him talking about coaching and how I don't shy away from coaching, like all these things you're like, man, this is so good. Or it I, could absolutely I, I, the last couple of years when I've been at Steelers training camp, my favorite time to watch Mike Tomlin is during stretching when everybody's stretching because he will go around to almost every guy on the team and have some kind of a one-on-one -on -one with that, with that player. And, and I would love to know what he's saying. I don't, with some of those guys, he's probably just, you know, shooting the ball, whatever. With some of those guys, he's probably saying meaningful things, uh, things that, that obviously are going to be important to, to their uh, play on the field. So he, he'd be a great one to mic up. Have you ever seen something on hard knocks, whether it's a way a team does something, a way a coach presents something and taken it and used it? I know you've used Tomlin stuff before, but have you ever seen something on hard knocks to wrap up this topic? We use seven shots. Yeah. From, from the Steelers yeah. training camp. That's a big popular drill of ours. I have not, I have not seen anything drill wise that I've implemented. I've, I've seen some of the funniest interactions the old Bob Wiley, the old uh, line coach. I can't remember who he was with at the time. Man, when he starts, to, he's, he's about, you know, he's about 70 some years old and about 300 something pounds. And he's talking to the guys about stretching. And when he says, you know, when, when those 18 year old kids were coming off the boats at D-Day at Normandy, you think they got to the <laughs> beach and they, and they said, hold on, let me stretch. And he's like, it's the biggest waste of time. <laughs> I mean, it was great stuff. <laughs> All right, let's go to our fifth and final topic before our player profile. OTAs begins this week for most of the league. And how much stock do you put into OTAs? What do you make of players who skip them? Obviously, Brandon Ayuk, we mentioned, uh, is, has been in the news, Cam Hayward. We kind of talked about this early on in the show. But there, there's a question I have. I'll let you reiterate what you said. You don't think it's a big deal, correct? I don't, no. 
Yeah. I think, I think again, that those guys are going to uh, make their statement in other ways and, and they're established veterans and well-respected. And so no, I don't think it's an issue. Brandon Ayuk, I think is an issue. You've been rumored to be on the trading block the entire off season to more than one team, but mainly the Steelers. And so we've heard a lot about that. Cam Hayward not going, I actually think could be an opportunity for, you know, Cam has been the captain of the Steelers for, I don't know how long he's been the captain. I think it, it lends itself to if Cam's not there, let someone else step up. Like, let someone else be that guy. Because you're going to have to be that guy at some point. He's not going to play forever. He's towards the end of his career, even if he gets an extension like he wants. TJ Watt, like, step up. Minka Fitzpatrick, be that leader. Uh, Russell Wilson, I'm sure, will do that for the offense because that's just his personality. But for Brandon Ayuk, to me, him not showing up is the, if you want to get paid, is that not the dumbest thing you could do, is not show up? It's a good point. I mean, I, I wonder if it's an, a deal where it's like a part of the negotiation. Uh, is that a, is that is he getting just the wrong advice from people? He's got you know San Francisco drafted Lad McConkey's a I think yep. a really good wide receiver, and I know he doesn't he and he and Ayuk are sort of different different types of receivers, but it, it's it's certainly not a situation that feels very secure for him. Right. But at the same time, I don't think he'd be staying away if he felt that it was really jeopardizing uh, his his situation, unless he's just getting bad advice. Well, I mean, they draft a, a receiver in round one, the kid out of Florida. I can't remember what his, what his name is. And so they go wide receiver in round one. You've been rumored to be on the trade block. You had all these weird, you know, social media posts about like, you know, I, I can't stand those uh, very vague posts and what they mean. I've always felt that the new trend was to hold in, you know, TJ Watt did this for the Steelers. He wanted a new contract. So did he skip training camp? No, he was there every day. What did he not do? No teamwork. Like he did no team drills. He did individual drills. Deontay Johnson, a few years after did that. And there's a number of other cases about this around the league. I guess for me, and maybe I'm old school coach, you're probably the same way. If I want to get paid, I'm not missing anything. I'm going to show up. I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to be the leader. I want to make myself so valuable that they say, we can't go without him. So we want to, if the next big monster wide receiver deal, you want AJ Brown money? We'll give it to you because you've been here. You've done everything. Some people will poo poo that. I think there's some serious magnitude when it comes to relationships between player and organization, but he could have also told him that he's not going to be there. So I don't know. Yeah, no, you're right. Uh, I think the same way. And yes, you're right. It was the Florida wide receiver that they took, not McConkie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ricky Pearsall, right? There Where did McConkey want it? Why, did he go to Washington? Maybe um, I, somewhere. I don't but, know. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I you know, I'm a my dad gave me a you know words to live by when when I was young uh, as an athlete, and he and he said uh, you know show them, don't tell them. Show them, don't yeah. tell them. You know, yeah. let that be your 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 mantra. And, uh, but this is a different generation. Very, very different. It is. It is. What's, what's your best ability? Your availability. Yeah. Are you not there? Then you're not available. So yeah. it's going to be interesting. We'll see how that plays out. Maybe it's an agreement that they knew, Hey, I'm going to miss this week of OTAs. I'm going to be, uh, at, out of town, whatever. I don't know. We'll see. All right. Let's finish this up with a very intriguing player profile. We <laughs> went in a different direction before we hit record and we are not going to shy away from, difficult topics on this show as it pertains to the national football league. So Harrison Butker, the kicker of the Kansas city chiefs has certainly made himself a known name in the overarching realm of society outside of football. And it was probably for what most people would say are all the wrong reasons. Now, for those that don't know the backstory and I'll be completely honest, hundred percent transparency. I did not watch all of the commencement speech that he gave at this. I think wasn't it a Benedictine college. So it was a, it was a, the Catholic faith that they, it's like a Jesuit school. Like that's the type of school he was speaking to. And he made some comments about his thoughts on masculinity, the female role in the household and things of that nature. Coach, what did you think about Harrison Butker's comments? Well, obviously I support his first amendment right to express himself. I have yeah. no problem at all with him using that platform. If he chose to express himself, I mean, <laughs> They had to kind of know what was going to be in the speech. But if you're going to tell a bunch of college graduates who just spent 
a boatload of money on their yep. on their college education that that girls you know you'll never be happier than when once you realize that your true calling is as a as a housewife and a mother which is what he, exactly what he told them i think there's probably a lot of them in the audience going like what uh, yeah but uh, I wasted a lot of money i <laughs> wasted a lot of money man <laughs> so contextually he may have I, I support his right to say what he said. I don't agree with a lot of things that he said. Uh, but and and I think that he has to understand if you use that forum publicly to say these things, then you're gonna get what comes back at you for that. So so hopefully yeah. I, I haven't heard any comments from him. So hopefully he's aware uh that, that yes, he inflamed some people. He doesn't seem to care, which is fine. That again, that's his right. Uh, but it really triggered some interesting discussions. I am a high school government and politics teacher. We did what we didn't watch the whole speech, but we watched a decent amount of it in my government and politics class. Oh, you're muted, coach. Hold on. Unmute yourself, coach. There we go. Yeah, we, yeah, we got a really interesting conversation going, and I thought that that was like meaningful to get people talking about subjects that are controversial is important. We spend so much time in this country. We are so polarized and we spend so much time shouting down the other without ever, ha ever having any real dialogue that, that at the bare minimum, he provided us an opportunity maybe to have some actual discourse. Well, that's, that's the problem in my opinion is not what he said. It's the fact that in today's day and age, you can call it cancel culture, whatever you want to call it. No one wants to have that discourse. Everyone just wants to attack what he was saying. Harrison Butker had every right, like you said, to have his own opinions and his own thoughts. And to a lot of the people that he was speaking to, they probably didn't view it as like crazy because he talked about the traditional Latin mass. And I mean, that's, that's a different like sect of Catholicism. And I went to a Catholic high school. And so I'm very familiar with a lot of those things. And so he's, he's a different type of person as it pertains to his thoughts on those type of things you bring up a great point and I just wish that there was an actual discourse because I heard some of his comments about how like men are viewed and everyone loves to say like these hot button terms, like toxic masculinity. I think that sometimes in a lot of ways, our young people in this country need strong male figures in their life, whether it's a coach, whether it's a teacher, whether it's hopefully their father, they need that. Like that, that, that is a part of us that, that is necessary for males and females as they grow. And I also think that, you know, I can speak only for my household. You know, now I am, we are a single income family. My wife stays home with our kids. She got a college degree. She was a teacher for 10 years and it just fit with our family. But she said, you know, no one ever told me when I was growing up that, you know what, if you had aspirations of, I want to be a mother, I want to have children and I want to help raise those children that that was ever even a, a possibility or be considered to be okay. And so I think that if he would have worded things differently, it might've come off differently. Some of the, some of the terms he uses like, Oh man, this is really cringe. Harry <laughs> Harrison, you could have worded this a little bit better. Uh, but ultimately my dad, he sent me a text. He goes, what's, what's everyone upset to this kicker about? And so I sent him a couple links. He goes, you think they're going to cut him? And I said, no, because he makes 55 yard field goals in the snow. <laughs> right. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. I'd love, to, I'd love how... to hear your thoughts. I'd love to hear your thoughts about what I said in terms of how he worded it. And do you think it could have come off different if he would have chosen his words better? Well, I think he was very tone deaf in a lot of regards. Yeah. He said his wife, his wife was never, she, the, the happiest she's ever been in her life was when she got married to him and started to raise their children. And I thought to myself, okay, well, on one hand, that could be true. Sure. On another hand, you're making twenty million dollars, dude. You know, like you you have hooked <laughs> your your wife up with a lifestyle <laughs> that very, very few people right. are ever going to have an opportunity to enjoy. And so there are some extenuating circumstances there. It's not quite so simple as she married you, dude. Uh, but <laughs> your comments about masculinity, I think, are really important. And I, and we talk about this a lot in our football program. It is really important for young men in a, in a society where a lot of the aggression is being taken out and, and, and aggression can, there, there's, there's positive and there's negative aggression. You know, there's aggression can, is a, almost a natural instinct for a lot of people and it has to be channeled in a positive direction. And, and 
things like football uh, and, and competitive sports, they give a lot of young men an opportunity to channel that in a positive direction. And, and in a society that is oftentimes trying to stifle it, it winds up not going in a positive direction. It winds up manifesting in, in other ways that are, that are much more dangerous or destructive. And it is really, really important to be able to have people guide young men, strong male role models to guide young men uh, and have conversations with them uh, about how they, they deal with their feelings, their emotions, the, uh, their, their, uh, you know, the intensity that they often feel. And we talk about that a lot. Um, and, but at the same time, there, there are, all, there's a line there uh, that I think you have to be aware of too, in that, you know, the way that you context things matter, the way that uh, the, 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 you have to be aware that we're living in an age where anything you say can go viral. Uh, and you know, you and I have to be aware of it all the time, right? Absolutely. So I think Harrison Butker, while there were some positive elements to what he said, absolutely could have contexted that more constructively. And that was the, when you talked about, you know, with the young men and, and the connections that you have as a coach, that was one of the most difficult things for me when I stopped coaching. I remember talking with players because I was a spring sport, uh, how to conduct themselves at prom. I remember talking about how they conduct themselves around their dates or whether they're just friends, it doesn't matter. And for some of these young men, they had never heard any of that before. And they didn't have the father figure at home. And I was, I was, I was assuming that role. And I had recognized that at least, and I, I treasured that. And, and I'm hoping that, you know, someone has taken over that can, they can also do that. But yeah, it's it, again, this is the discussion that I wish more people would have instead of just getting on social media and saying, you're an idiot that wears 10 pounds of gel in your hair and you kick footballs for a living. So, okay. Yeah. If we want to dumb people down to just what they do, I just wish that there would have been a discussion. Kudos to you for doing this in your class. Uh, I would have loved to be there to be a part of it, but uh, yeah. Any final thoughts on that? Well, we, we have to have, more of a dialogue in this country. We are we're we're headed towards a, a presidential election that is going to be ugly uh, and divisive, and uh, and there's a lot of problems in this country and in the world. And those problems do not have simplistic solutions. There aren't easy fixes to complicated things, and it requires people to be able to talk about stuff in order to find those solutions. And so I would just hope that as a society we can just kind of we can be better. At that, my, my suspicion is it's going to get worse before it gets better, but that's another subject. <laughs> it's a whole other show. Yeah. All right, coach, uh, do, a, do us a favor. Let us know what's coming up on the call sheet this week. Right. So episode 57 on the call sheet. We're really going to try to uh, just start to look ahead to the, to the 2024 season. Uh, one of the things that that I put out on Twitter today was uh, just a just a play that the Dolphins ran last year. With a, a new a new motion uh, called exit motion, which is a short, quick motion from the inside of a formation to the outside, and it kind of revolutionized offense. Everybody quickly copycatted it. Everybody started to use it. So we're going to try to look ahead and and speculate on what what might be some of the trends uh, that that you'll see take over football in in 2024. It's going to be a lot of fun. I do appreciate it. And I appreciate all your time, coach. We will be back next week for another NFL whip around. In the meantime, coach, take it easy. We'll see you.